Christian College presents Bible Prophecy Lectures, Revelation Verse by Verse with Special Prophecy Topics. Main Teacher, Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan and Co-Teacher, Dr. Christine Joy Tan. Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary with a Master of Theology and at Grace Theological Seminary with a Doctor of Theology. A pastor, a seminary professor, and a Bible prophecy speaker for 50 years to over 500,000 people worldwide, he authored several popular books on prophecy and illustrations. Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan is a founding pastor and senior pastor emeritus of Grace Christian Church of the Philippines and the senior chaplain emeritus of Grace Christian College. He is a former director of Asian Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. Co-teaching with him is his beloved daughter, Dr. Christine Joy Tan. Dr. Christine Joy Tan has two earned PhD degrees from Dallas Theological Seminary in Bible Exposition and from the University of North Texas in Higher Education. Dr. Christine Joy Tan now serves as the president of Grace Christian College. She is also a Bible prophecy lecturer, a Christian educator, author of several journal articles, and editor of books. To date, Dr. Christine has led and co-led some 30 Bible land tours in the Middle East and Europe under the Paul Lee Tan Prophetic Ministries. Session number two is Revelation chapters two and three, Christ's Letters to the Seven Churches, part one by Rev. Dr. Paul Lee Tan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our weekly Bible study on Revelation verse by verse. Today, we are studying something unique in the Bible. Seven love letters from Christ in heaven to earth. Letters which Jesus personally sent from glory, using the first-person pronoun, I, I, I. We will study how Jesus looks at his churches today from glory, what he lovingly approves, and what he fiercely disapproves. And we will learn how to earn eternal rewards based on the heavenly standards set by the Divine Judge. Today, we will study three main topics. First, the vision of Christ in heaven. Secondly, the seven churches, their history and geography. Thirdly, the seven letters themselves, lessons for today. Revelation chapter 1 verse 12 And I turned to see the voice that spake to me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. The seven candlesticks were the seven churches of Asia Minor. We will study the seven churches soon, but let us continue. We take a closer look at Christ himself. Here are ten features of the glorified Christ. First, in verse 13 of chapter 1, One like unto the Son of Man. In heaven, imagine, Jesus still looks like the Son of Man. He retained his true God and true man person in glory. He, his immortal body bears the marks of the cross. 
Number two, he is clothed with a garment down to the foot, a picture of the high priest ministering in the Holy of Holies. The high priest conveys God's will to the people and the people's needs to God. And Christ is doing that today for you and me. He is praying for us. Number three, he has a golden girder around his chest. This is symbolic of readiness and strength, like a girded warrior. In Revelation, we will see many wars and struggles between forces of good and evil, but we always see God in control, and God will always win the fight. Number four, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Age and antiquity. Antiquity are signs of his wisdom and his respect. Number five. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Christ is depicted in Revelation chapter one here as with indignant eyes, fiery indignant eyes. Chapters two and three of Revelation gives us some reasons why Christ was displeased with most of the seven churches. Number six, his feet are like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. In the tabernacle, the altar was made of brass. It was the place where sin was dealt with. The emphasis here is on judgment and repentance. Number seven, his voice is as the sound of many waters. Here is an overwhelming sense of Christ in control. Number eight, verse 16, he had in his right hand seven stars. These stars are the seven pastors or messengers of the seven churches. Pastors are under shepherds of the great shepherd, Christ. We who do God's work must be inside Christ's hands all the time, under his control. Verse number nine, verse 16, out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The divine, the words from Christ's mouth are that of judgment and punishment. Finally, number 10, his countenance was as the sun shined in his strength. The divine nature of Christ is emphasized here. He is not only the Son of Man, He is the Son of God. Verse 17, And when I saw Him, I fell at His feet as dead. The old Apostle John, in his mortal body, was completely overwhelmed by seeing the glorified Christ in heaven. Someday in heaven, don't worry, we will have a glorified resurrected body to enjoy heaven forever. And he laid his right hand upon me saying, fear not. Now here are three reasons not to fear for the future. First, Christ said, I am the first and the last the Alpha and Omega. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Second reason is, He liveth forever. He said, I am He that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. The fearful disciples of Christ had become courageous overcomers because they knew Christ is alive. The third reason not to be afraid for the future is, Christ says, I have the keys of hell and of death. There is no other way to escape hell. Only Christ has the keys of hell, hell and death, and He is our personal Lord and Savior. And verse 19 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be, 
hereafter. This is a very brief threefold outline of the whole book of Revelation. First, the things which thou hast seen is in chapter 1, seeing Jesus in heaven. The things which are, are in chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches in earth, on earth in Revelation. And the things which shall be are in chapters 4 to 21 and 22, all about future prophecy. Let's go on, verse 20. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Notice, Jesus describes the leaders of the start of the church as stars and angels. In these last days, pastors and spiritual leaders must lead with decisiveness as stars and angels, and yet with humility as servant leaders. The same verse in verse 20 says, The seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Notice, Christ pictured the seven churches as candlesticks. So, in heaven's viewpoint, churches on earth are to shine like candlesticks for Christ. The church is to be the salt and light of the world. Let us draw a candlestick also called the menorah in Israel. First draw the letter U, then another U below it, then another U still below it, three U's. Then from top to bottom, draw the stem of the candlestick and then give it a base from left to right below. That's a simple drawing of a candlestick. In Jerusalem, the Israel's parliament, the Knesset, outside the building, is a giant-sized menorah or candlestick because it is a symbol of Israel. There is a plant in Israel that grows like a candlestick. So amazing. Now we come to the second main topic for today. The seven churches their history and their geography. Verse 11 of chapter 1 says, What thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia Minor, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These were the major cities closest to Patmos Island, where John was exiled. So starting from Patmos Island, the messenger or courier would have to cross the Aegean Sea and go to the first major city on the mainland called Ephesus, also the capital of Asia Minor. Then he would go up north to Smyrna, then bring this letter still up north to Pergamon, then continue down south to Thyatira, then to Sardis, further south, and still south to Philadelphia, and finally to the southern city of Laodicea. Let us now study the historical geography of these seven churches. First, the church of Ephesus. Ephesus means the desired one. It represents the first true church, the apostolic church. The greatest apostle Paul spent three years here in Ephesus teaching, using a rented school hall from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. For Paul to spend three years in a place, we could imagine what an impact he would have made. The Ephesian church was one of the largest churches in that area because Ephesus was the capital city. The whole city of Ephesus, however, worshipped the goddess Diana. Its fame, Temple of Artemis, was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. Revelation chapter 2 verse 4 says, 
Nevertheless, thou hast left thy first love. Now, most of the Ephesian Christians there were now second generation believers. They continued to work hard for the Lord against the evil forces all around them. But their honeymoon sparkle of love for Christ was no longer there. Lesson for us, don't take Christ for granted. Renew our daily devotions with Bible reading, prayers, and singing. Be vigilant and fervent in loving Jesus. Let's go on. Secondly, the church of Smyrna. Smyrna means myrrh. Myrrh was used in biblical times inside the temple worship and also for burials. This represented the period of the greatest suffering and persecution for the early church. The city of Smyrna was on the direct route from Rome to India and Persia. It was very important. It competed against Ephesus to be the commercial center of Asia Minor. But the Lord wrote to the church in Revelation 2.9, I know thy poverty, but thou art rich. Even though located in a very rich city, the church was a poor church. But Christ said, you are rich. In his promises, his care, his concern, his ministries. Be thou faithful unto death, verse 10, and I will give thee a crown of life. Ten generations of Christians during that time, about two million believers were buried in the catacombs outside Rome during some 300 years of persecution. Thirdly, the third church is called Pergamos. Pergamos means thoroughly married. How come? Well, the Emperor Constantine Christianized the Roman Empire, uniting church and state. Virtually everyone, everyone was declared a Christian, but this actually corrupted Christianity. The name Pergamos means stronghold. It was built high on a mountain top, the city. Christ said that they live where Satan's throne is. Actually, the first temple for emperor worship, worship of the emperor was built here in Pergamon. This ancient city of Pergamon was almost totally given over to idolatry. It worshiped a great multitude of gods. Nevertheless, church history described good events during those days, such as the Council of Constantinople, which defined and affirmed that Jesus is truly God and truly man. Then occurred at that time, the Council of Chalcedon, which formulated the doctrine of the hypostatic union of Jesus' person. That is, Jesus' human nature and divine nature are forever united in his one person, the God-man. These orthodox doctrines vitally strengthen Christianity. Fourth, the fourth church is the church of Thyatira. Thyatira means continually sacrificing. It denotes the Middle Ages, which developed and evoked the doctrine of the Mass. Now, Thyatira was a very wealthy city too. It was noted for its bright red colored dyes used in clothing manufacturing. Its trade, its powerful trade unions could give laborers jobs, good jobs, but 
they must submit their religion to the union's prescription. And so, to be a true Christian, they would be jobless and poor, or they must accept at the immoral practices of what Revelation called Jezebel, the wicked queen. In medieval church history, the Roman church initially had good works and leaders, but it soon degenerated in many of its doctrines and practices, which resulted in the subsequent Reformation. The fifth church is called Sardis Church, which would typify the Reformation period. Now the city of Sardis, like Pergamos, was built on the mountain top 1,000 feet high. It was so secured that the wealthy King Croesus of Lydia, the legendary King Croesus, stored and hide and hid his fabled treasures here in Sardis. But that attracted the Persian king Cyrus and the Syrian king Antiochus to attack this city and steal all the treasures in BC 549, as the inhabitants were sleepy and unprepared. Revelation 3.1 Thou livest but are dead. Like the secular city, the Reformation Church was very self-satisfied and soon become dead in the eyes of Christ. It degraded into state or national churches with emphasis on formalism and religiosity, outward display of religion. The sixth church here is the Church of Philadelphia. Philadelphia means brotherly love. It denotes the end time true Christian church. Now Philadelphia city was located, located on the imperial postal road from Rome to the eastern parts of the Roman Empire. It helped spread it, the Greek language and culture far away. That was the city of Philadelphia. Christ in Revelation 3 8 says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. For Christianity, this was the age of the missionary movement, the foreign missions movement, with an open door to all the world. The Bible was in the hands of the common people. It was the only church in Revelation 7 churches that, that says Christ loved it, the church that Christ loved. Finally, the seventh church is the church of Laodicea, the last church here. Laodicea came to mean lukewarm or indifferent. The Laodicean church represented the end time false church. Now the city of Laodicea was founded in BC 260 and was very, very wealthy and proud too. It was so proud that when it was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 60, it refused to accept the emperor's offer to help and rebuild the city themselves. Now the city of Laodicea got its water supply from another city called Hierapolis up north. It had no natural water supply. And so they built a six-mile aqueduct between the two cities to channel water in between. The waters of Hierapolis were very good. It had lots of minerals, good for therapeutic use. Hierapolis also had many refreshing hot springs. But by the time their water reached Laodicea down south, it had become lukewarm and tepid, not ideal for bathing or drinking. 
Revelation 3.16 says, Because thou art lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The Laodicean believers were physically rich, but spiritually very poor. Christ has nothing to praise the Laodicean church in Revelation. Now we come to the final third main topic today. It is the seven letters themselves, which has many lessons for us to learn from today. First, when we study Revelation 2 and 3, immediately we notice that all the seven letters follow one standard format as follows. First, Christ's divine titles. Then, his approval of that church. Then, his disapproval of that church. Then, his advice to that church. Finally, Christ promises for that church. All seven churches had this similar identical letter. Now we will do something different. Let us combine all the seven churches to the, together under each of these five elements or themes. That is, let us study all their good points together, then all their bad points together, and so on. By combining all similar passages together, we get a good summary uh, sense of what Christ likes and dislikes for his churches today. Now, the first combined theme are, as we can see here, the titles of Christ. It starts with the titles of Christ because Jesus is establishing his authority to write to the seven churches, his titles. Let's go to see his titles in all seven uh, uh, letters to the seven churches. Notice all seven letters begin with the words, this thing said he. Every letter begins with these words, this thing said he. He, Christ, said it. So we all simply will now read the Bible verses and listen directly to Christ's words. We will comment on the subsequent key words on the right column in our chart. First, to Ephesus, this thing said he that holdeth the seven stars, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. To Smyrna, this thing said he, the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. To Pergamos, this thing said he, which had the sharp sword with two edges. To Thyatira, this thing said the Son of God, who had his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. To Sardis, this thing said he, that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. To the church of Philadelphia, this thing said he that is holy, he that is true, he that had the key of David, he that opened it and no man shut it. Finally, to Laodicea, this thing said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation. Of God. Now, in all these Christ uh, titles of Christ, we we may find at least seven key words in the right hand column of our chart here. A. Christ is the head of His own church. Note that the Ephesian church was extra blessed to have had three famous pastors. Number one, the greatest apostle Paul was their pastor. Number two, the oldest apostle John was also their pastor. And three, 
the faithful disciple Timothy was also pastor there. They were real stars. Yet, notice they were all inside Jesus' right hand. Let us focus on Christ, the head of his own church, not just on his spiritual leaders, even though they are stars. Secondly, B, we find the key word, the risen Lord. Christ is the risen Lord. He is alive. That means he could help us today. It also means he knows everything and would judge us. C. Christ is the final judge. The sharp sword with two edges means Christ cuts through all the hidden things and would judge righteously and rightly. D. Christ is the righteous Son of God. Christ came the first time as the Son of Man to save and to die for mankind. But Christ's second coming will be a Son of God to judge the, the world. E. Christ is the sender of the Holy Spirit. And today, Christ sends the Holy Spirit as our divine comforter for our daily needs. And the Holy Spirit is also our divine guide to guide us into all truths. If Christ is the holder of the key of David and of heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Finally, G. Christ is the truthful witness. What Christ said in the Bible is all true. What he will be telling us in Revelation about the future is 100% accurate. Now, the second combined theme is Christ's approval of that church. Note that all approval statements of Christ in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 begins with the same word, I know, I know, I know, I know, seven times. To the church of Ephesus, Jesus said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. I, Jesus knows everything. And how they, you cannot bear those that are evil. All the good things Jesus knows and has not fed, fainted and you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. We will just read the Bible verse and hear directly Christ's words. To Smyrna, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. To Pergamon, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest in the high mountain top, even where Satan's seat is, but you hold fast my name, and has not denied my faith. To Thyatira, I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, everything, and thy works, even the last works are more than the first works. That is so commendable. To Sardis, I know thy works, Thou hast a name that thou livest, but are dead. Yet there, is, there are a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Sardis was a garment manufacturing city. And Jesus said they are worthy. To Philadelphia, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. I have loved thee. To Laodicea, the last church, none, no approval, none at all. 
Now when we combine all these verses of Christ's approval to all seven churches, we note these key words on the right column of this chart. The first key word is we immediately note, I know these two words. All seven letters of Christ's approval stated started with these words. But heaven is so far away. How could Christ know? Actually, there are three heavens. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. The second heaven is space, which no one knows its limits. And the third heaven is God's throne. That's where Christ, the Trinity, and the angels are. How could Jesus know from afar, know us from afar, in such detail? The answer is, the Holy Trinity is omniscient and omnipresent, all-knowing and all everywhere present, including on earth. Also, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit dwells today within our hearts. The second key word is B. I know thy works. Christ knows all our works on earth, whether people see it or not. Let me tell about a certain church co-worker in the Philippines. For so, some 50 years in our church, he did not preach. He was not even ordained. He refused to be. He faithfully served as administrative pastor, and then church minister, youth pastor, and now senior citizen minister, all successfully. All ages, such an ex excellent example of Christian service. His name is Pastor Berto. We all call him Pastor Berto for Alberto Chan. You know, someday in heaven, we will be very surprised. People who were not especially known or well known on earth uh, were so well known in heaven. The third key word is thy poverty. I know thy poverty, Jesus said, but you are rich. During those times, the worship of emperor was practiced. Those who refused to worship the emperor had no jobs and were persecuted or killed. As a result, Christians were very poor. But Christ told them, you are rich. And the Bible said, because they look for a city whose builder is God, where there will be no more tears, no sorrow, no pain, no crying in the new Jerusalem, which we will study in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. The fourth key word here is, I know thy little strength. In God's service, Little strength is great virtue. God chose the weak and the meek so that his strength and power could be even better revealed. Imagine David and Goliath. David's little strength with a slingshot was able to show God's mighty power in bringing down Goliath. E, thy patience. Jesus said, I know how patient you are. Few years ago, I had what they call knee replacement surgery, the left knee. They said that knee surgery is even more painful than heart bypass surgery. I believe it because I went through both of it. Anyway, after knee surgery, I must undergo knee rehab, knee rehabilitation, trying to bend my new knee using ropes and weights. 
it was so painful. And there was the rehab nurse, the male nurse, who would come to our house every other day and give and gave me uh, this rehab treatments. He would come to our house always wearing a black t-shirt with the words, no pain, no gain. Because of that, I refused to get my right knee operated on. Today, my left knee is stronger than the right knee. Why? Because I tried to be patient even under painful rehab. Another key word is F, holding fast. We would notice in these two chapters of Revelation, hold fast, hold fast, kept being repeated by Christ. Remember Daniel the prophet. As a youth, Daniel was taken captive to Babylon from Jerusalem. He held fast to his faith. God made him ten times wiser than all the Babylonian wise men. He made no mistakes because he prayed consistently. Three times a day facing Jerusalem all his life. His enemies threw him into the lion's den. The result, God delivered Daniel. You know, God needed only one angel to do it. There's a song that says, Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. G, keyword G, hatred of the Nicola Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitans means to conquer the people. Most probably it meant those who compromised their Christian beliefs and faith with pagan idolatry. It was so easy to do that, being surrounded with idolaters. They would mix Christian worship with idol worship. They filled the church with worldliness and carnal practices taken from the world. And Christ said, I hate them. The Nicolaitans. The last one is key word for it. We find nothing. No approval for Laodicea church. None at all. None at all. As we continue to study these letters of Christ, dear friends, brothers and sisters, we realize how much Christ knows about each of his churches on earth. It's one of them. And Christ continues to walk in the midst of his churches today. Christ, the head of the church, has words of approval, words of disapproval, words of counsel and advice, words of hope and promises to the seven churches. We will continue to study this in our next session. So we bow in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for talking to us through thy word today. Thank you for promising to bless those who read, who listen to, and who obey the book that written in the book of Revelation. Bless each of us, Lord, as we go on our ways this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless each of you.